Uh, my name is Jason Wisnat. Uh, a lot of friends call me Wizard. Uh, I sing for a band called, well, I sang for a band called Kansas City Faggots. Sang for a band called New Style American Boyfriends, MS Jesus, Rocktopus, and Fallout. Uh, all Dallas bands. Been playing music since about, probably about 92, 93. Um, after I went to, uh, one of my first shows was actually at, uh, at Club uh, Clearview in Dallas, uh, and that was the Dwarves and Flipper, and that was one of the greatest shows ever, and it's one of the things that started me wanting to make music in the first place, just because of the offensiveness of the show in the first place. It was, uh, it was really good, they played about five songs, broke everything, and left the stage and I was like after that I was like dude this is what I need to be doing because it lets out a lot of aggression and everything you know it kind of lets you uh, get your mind off the monotony and the redundancy of everyday life oh. Club Clearview uh, it kind of looked like uh, and it's kind of hard to describe it was a building attached to another couple of bars at the end of a street, and uh, when you walk in, it's it had several rooms. One of them was like a yuppie room where they had martinis and such, and then uh, you had another room where they had uh, the venue was, uh, you know, they had everything from psychobilly to fucking ska bands and punk rock, everything you can think of. But it seemed to to uh, be more active back in the '90s than it did. It started to die off a little bit when the two, when the aughts approached, and the punk rock scene started dying a little bit down in Dallas. And then uh, a few bands came back around and kind of revived it for a while. And you had some other venues open, like uh, you know, like Red Blood Club, and uh, you had Spider Babies for a while, and those were great venues to play at. They were uh, they were equally as fun. Um, you had a lot of good touring acts come through there. You had a lot of good local acts coming in and, and playing in those places. Uh, shows there are always fucking manners. Like, we played there a couple of times. We set off so many smoke bombs that you couldn't even see in the club at Spider Babies. We had a smoke machine and smoke bombs going on simul simultaneously. You couldn't see fucking 10 feet or 10 inches in front of your face. Very difficult to play. Um... Yeah, Dallas was pretty crazy back in the 90s and then in the early aughts, but then it, it kind of died off a little bit. Yeah. Why do you think it was dying off? I think, I don't think it was the lack of talent. I think it was the lack of, I don't know, maybe people just weren't coming out for some reason. It was odd because there was a lot of fucking good band. I mean, you had, shit, you had the Backstabbers, you had the Riverboat Gamblers, you had us, which was Rocktopus back then, uh, you had uh, you had all kinds of it. You had the Swingin' Dicks. You had all kinds of bands back then, and uh, it just seemed like you know there would be a few nights every like maybe twice a year where everyone would come out, and it would be like one specific show. But then the other nights, uh, you depending on where you would go, it would be really hit or miss unless you went to places that were like constants like a, you know somewhere like bar of soap bar of soap for instance like you'd have you know regulars there they're fucking all day drinkers they go in there at fucking 10 o'clock in the morning and drink all day long until close and they would fill the place the, the majority of the time but you know the other venues it, if there wasn't a big show they were kind of dead yeah what well, kind describe what bar of soap was Bar of Soap was like a fucking awesome, it's like the epitome of punk rock. Like, it's just despicable. It was a laundromat slash bar, all right? I wouldn't wash my clothes in the fucking laundry, in that place, if my life depended on it. You could walk in the bathroom at any given time and probably scrape like a sixteenth of blow off the back of the fucking toilet. Um, wonderful place, man. One of the funnest places I've ever been in my life. I mean, you know, all joking aside, which part of that's joking, part of it's not. Uh, all joking aside, a fantastic place to play. Charlie, the owner, was a rad dude. Steve-O, a rad dude. God rest his soul. 
you know, everybody that went in and that, out of that place really kind of made up the Dallas scene for the most part. Um, Spasm House was fun, man. Uh, <laughs> Brad, uh, the drummer, Kamsaki, used to uh, he used to drive this van we called the fucking Fumigator because it had no catalytic converter on it. So you could drive like 10 feet and the whole inside of the van would smell like fucking... like you're in a gas chamber. And, uh, he, and not only that, he had this... Uh, the light thing that hangs down in between the seats like dangled by two fucking wires, but it dangled like a foot. So anytime you take a fucking right or left, it would fucking smash <laughs> one of you in the head. Like, pow! You know, you take a right or left, pow! The light would hit you right in the head, and you're all, because the fumes in the car. Anyway, uh, one night, it was bar, uh, no, not bar soap. Uh, it was Orbit Room's anniversary, and uh, this chick was having this giant fucking party, and they had a keg, and they had it in a, in the front yard of her house, there's like, there's probably 150 people there, man. And she had this keg in a fucking, oh, I hope this doesn't get out to her. She had this keg in a fucking, in a baby pool, one of those plastic baby pools out in front of her house. And me and Bra uh, Brad drive up in the fucking fumigator and everybody's out there. I've got a bottle of whiskey and a bottle of sweet and sour and I'm making whiskey sours in my mouth like no cup or anything, and fucking walking around just ah, drunk, fucking hammered, and uh, we notice that that keg is sitting there, and you know there's a few people walking up and tapping on it and shit, and fucking drinking a few beers. So me and me and Brad walked up and said, "Hey, we're gonna go get this refilled." <laughs> we put it in the back of the fumigator and drove that to the spasm house and finished it off in about four days. That was good times, man, but. I'm pretty sure they were pretty pissed. You want to smoke? Yeah. That's good for his ass, man. You ain't never going Really? You never going He's filming me the whole time. He actually works for the DEA. <laughs> this is about the time the cops come all over. He puts up the product. The eagle has left the nest. See, that's why you need to stick to singers. <laughs> stick to singers because you fucking stop yeah, yeah, messing around with those bass players, dude. You're going to get the fucking story of a lifetime. <laughs> I was a singer just for kidding. 10 years. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The size of the spectrum. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Cool. Let's talk about some bands, some local bands that you like. What, were, what are your favorite local Dallas punk bands? Well, it depends on what era you're talking. Like, if you're, if you're talking like, uh, you know, the stuff that I really started on, it'd be like probably anything Barry, Barry Coot has been in, the Nerve Breakers, uh, Stickmen with Ray Guns, a lot of Bobby Socks shit. Like, what, what about Bobby Socks and Stickmen with Ray Guns is it that you love? They're so raw, and Bobby was such a hick. Like, I mean, you'd walk into Bar of Soap and see Bobby there, and he'd have a fucking pair of acid wash cut off Daisy Dukes with long johns on underneath them. And, like, he would wear that and literally think that, okay, that, that's okay. Like, that's that was just him. He's fucking nuttier than squirrel turds. But he was such a genius when it came to just being a degenerate like weirdo and he wrote some really crazy like check out scavenger of death listen to the lyrics of scavenger of death it's pretty weird man he's out there okay uh, what, what about the nerve breakers nerve breakers are just man that's just like the epitome of what every dallas dude wanted to do like when you first find, like, rock and roll, you know, like, when you first find your first MC5 record or first Dead Boys record or or Ramones record, something like that, and you want, you figure out you want to play rock and roll, but you're from Dallas, you put on the Nerve Breakers, and that's what, that's what comes out. That's it. I mean, that's just it. It's greatness, pure greatness. What about Pump and Ethel? 
<clears throat> oh man, Turner, Turner and Hank are such great people. Turner has such, been such an influence. Not only, I mean, a lot of people don't know this. Not only musically has he been a giant influence in this city, he's been a giant influence artistically. That guy has done more art. I, I mean, the motherfucker makes shit out of roadkill. He takes dead animals, skins them, bleaches their bones, and makes art out of it. And some of the art is the most amazing thing you will ever see. I mean, you, you really should check it out. Turner Van Blarkham. Uh, Pumpin' Ethel as a band. Awesome, man. Just uh, fun to watch. Always uh, very comedic. Uh, Turner had a tendency to be very political with a lot of his statements and his music. Had a uh, tendency to be very loud and obnoxious, which you wouldn't expect anything less if you knew the dude. Uh, but all around, uh, a great band and a great bunch of guys. Yeah, what about the Boozers? Texas Todd and the Boozers. Greatness. Uh, old, old friends of mine. Uh, Tracy and Todd have been playing in bands together since, fuck, probably the 80s, the late 80s. Uh, the Boozers being one of them. They've been around for off and on for probably 25 years. You know, they're outlasting most of the crap that's around now. Uh, they're in a band now called Free to Kill Again uh, with uh, Big Days and and uh, Tracy and Todd. I'm not sure who's drumming for them right now, but uh, it's always Mor a good show. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the Mullins are greatness. We played with them uh, a couple of times, once at Double Wide, which is a, I, I hate to say new, because shit, I think it's, what, 10 years old now? Something like that, but God, I feel old. Uh, when it, w one of the first couple of years it was opened, we played there with them, and uh, this was with the Kansas City Faggots, um, and uh, the Sons of Hercules, and uh, they're from Austin. Fucking f another fantastic band. The Mullins as well. Great, great bands. Uh, Describe what kind of band the Mullins is. Uh, the Mullins is very... Uh, they're like if you took... If you added another set of balls to the stones and uh, a little bit more distortion and maybe used an orange fucking amplifier, it's uh, it's kind of kind of in that vein. It's uh, kind of Chesterfield Kings. Uh, psychedelic meets just plain, just good, old-fashioned rock and roll. Like, just kick-ass licks and uh, good vocals. Like, what, like, what do you think drew you to, like, punk rock? What do I think drew me to like it? Uh, probably the sense of there being, you being able to choose your own, your own destiny, kind of. Not complete and total anarchy, but, like, you being able to just kind of make up your mind to what you like and what you don't. And if someone else doesn't like it, fuck them. Like, who cares? You know, um, it doesn't always have to be a negative thing, you know. It's a good way to express yourself. It's a positive way to express yourself, to release inner demons. That's what I do when I sing, man. I, I can't sing good unless I've got something negative on my mind. Because what I'm trying to do when I sing is get that fucking negativity out of my brain and get it, release it out of my mouth and throw it at the fucking crowd. And if that comes in the way of me spitting on them or fucking throwing bottles at them or whatever, then so be it. But that's just the way I look at it, you know? It's, it's a positive way for me to release my inner demons. 